final battle takes place predominantly at Hogwarts. It's epic, there's only one word for it. There's fire and flying and all kinds of running around and climbing. I've never run up and down so many stairs in my entire life. It's pretty hair raising, but it's amazing because you just get to see Hogwarts all over again, particularly the Great Hall. In the last film, we never really saw Hogwarts, so now we arrive at the Great Hall and see it in all its grandeur and then see it destroyed. It feels quite haunting and apocalyptic. All the magic's gone. The Great Hall doesn't look like the Great Hall anymore. And there's something just hey. shocking about having something that has this mythic value, I think, violated and broken. <laughs> Not bad. We're coming from the door down there and we're just chatting away. And I walked in here and didn't even notice. And then suddenly I got to this point here and I saw all these beds. And then that's when I turned around, looked around me and just saw all the walls caved in and smashed glass back there. There's a load of injured or dead people lying, like laid out in the natural hall itself. It was a totally different environment. And the first time we walked in there, for some reason, it shot into my head all the times when we used to see the owls flying with the post. And one remembers like Christmas parties in there with floating candles and massive feasts and full of colour and light. And whenever we have a new cast member come in, they always talk about when they walked into the Great Hall set. Because it's just, it's amazing. They made the whole thing out of stone and wood, and it stood the test of time, really. But I'm sure it's heartbreaking for all the people as well who have, over the years, been building all the amazing sets that we have. But I think sometimes when something is destroyed, it shows the scale of it. Action! Greater Hall Destruction, in a way, it is the center of Hogwarts is the spine of Hogwarts, it's the, the absolute essential skeleton of it. And so in destroying that, reducing it to this profile of rubble, you were making a very significant image. I'll lure him into the castle! I did know that when, when you saw Hogwarts like that, I knew we, ultimately we weren't coming back. You realised very much that we were moving towards the end of the journey. I've seen it built and I've seen it knocked down. This, like, Whoa, we'll never be the same again. Today, I have to walk up and sit beside Neville at one point, and I saw all the hourglasses were smashed, and it was just like symbolized all the houses have to unify. There's no competition anymore. This is bigger than anything at school. We got back into the Great Hall, and we're all here trying to find a little defense of, of Hogwarts that goes on in this room. This is where we first started our Hogwarts career. So it's quite fitting that here we are gonna, gonna finish it as well. It's really been such a big part of my life and me growing up. It's nice to come back to Hogwarts, even if it is in ruins. Hogwarts is threatened. Man the boundaries, protect us. Do your duty to our school. <laughs> I'm Hermione Granger, and you are? Um, Ron Weasley. Pleasure. I always thought that Hermione and Ron would be together. Always. <laughs> I always thought that she had a crush on Ron from the very beginning. I think over the years, we're seeing a lot more depth in these characters, because obviously at this point, Ron is kind of cares a lot about Hermione. Hermione. Like on the brink of falling in love. And all this tension that's been building for the previous seven films, for the previous six and a half books. We've been desperate for the two of them to get together. And now they do. I've never got this far before. They go to the Chamber of Secrets to destroy Horcrux. 
the skeleton of the basilisk as to where we left it in the, in the second one, so it was kind of eerie. That's the scene where Ron and Hermione have their little moment. They knew it was kind of coming, because, you know, it's part of the story, it was in the script, but they worry a lot about it. Yeah, David kind of sprang it on us. There's a scene that we're shooting later this week that we should talk about once you've read it. So have a look at it, because we're doing the kiss this week between Ron and Hermione. What? Doing the kiss between Ron and Hermione in, this the, cha week. in the Chamber of Secrets. I was dreading it, to be honest. You are not uh, allowed to be on <laughs> Everyone was there for my kiss. I think just because I've known us for so long, it's kind of like 10 years. If someone is literally like a sibling to you, you've grown up with them. Being put in a situation where you have to kiss them is is just really awkward. I think we kind of built it up into this kind of really awkward, horrible kind of thing. Because there's so much anticipation with these two. Because it has been building up since the early ones. So we both wanted to do it right. And we're rolling. We have a close set. It's always good to have a few people on the set as possible and to make it as comfortable for them as possible. OK, guys, here we go, shooting. Rupert was like, I don't know how we're going to do it. And I was like, I've got no idea either. And action. We were both more worried about the fact that we just wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a trouble kind of keeping a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just wasn't working. And I just said to Rupert, don't be Rupert, forget Rupert, just be Ron. Just let Ron take over in that moment. And I said the same thing to Emma, let Hermione take over in that moment. And Emma, as ever, is so smart. She knows that rather than doing 27 takes, she knew if she committed really early, <laughs> we'd get it. <laughs> I saw her make the decision in her eyes. I saw her think, I'm going to have to really go for it. I just kind of had to put the incredible amount of history that I have with Rupert aside and be Hermione. So um, she really went for it, much to Rupert's surprise. She just went boom, right in there. I mean, when we were doing it, they're in a huge amount of danger. They've nearly just died. And I think in that moment, it's about both of them realising, if we're going to die tonight, the one thing I actually want to do is kiss you. Once we did it, it was, yeah, it was, it was nice. I think they kind of leave some of that laughing in. Because <laughs> uh, I think it's quite a natural kind of thing. That was great, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite romantic, really. It was good. He's a nice kisser. It was very bizarre on the last day. I mean, we, it was really emotional. We just kind of came in and, and did a day's work, and then it sort of all ended. It was very strange the last day. Very good. Here go, guys. So it's just a final big leap. Yeah. Oh my God. One last leap. <laughs> One last leap. Fine. One last leap. Fine. I wasn't really looking forward to it that much in the sense that it was the last day. We already felt it was going to be difficult and awkward. This is such an ironic way to... I know. It's a very strange last yeah. shot, I know. And the morning itself was quite tense. And I just felt the best way to deal with it was get through it as quickly as possible and not labour and not do loads of takes and just get to the moment where we could say, that's a wrap. And cut. And check the cake. Okay, cut I feel like I've blocked out the memory because it's almost it was almost like too much. Can I just ask everyone just to uh, join us over by the monitor over there to my right in that open area? If everyone could just head over there, please, that'd be great. It didn't 
quite feel real and it, it was a bit it was a bit traumatic. I can't really imagine life without this yet. Because it has literally I've been I'm filming longer than I haven't been filming. First day of principal oh, photography, okay. only 247 to go. I don't think in, in film, television history there have been anything quite like it, or we've all grown up with this, these characters and with each other. This is our second home, basically. It's going to be sad to say goodbye to this place, for one. More importantly, yeah, the people that, that, that dwell within it. We're like a family, a fairly functional family at that. It's been an incredible journey. We take what we do very seriously, but we have a lot of fun doing it. And then. You all right? Wow. Straight. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Not you. Yeah. I'm going to miss kind of playing around. <laughs> and action. Please behave. Yeah, I think we've kind of, over the years, we've kind of blended into one kind of person. I feel like there are so few roles out there that have smart women in them, smart girls, and I feel very privileged to have played Hermione, definitely. It is like you miss a friend or something. And um, so, you know, there's, there's stuff I got to do in this part which, which I loved and, and will probably never have a chance to do again. like it will ever be over and it, it'll always be, I don't know, part of who I am and it'll always, just, it'll always be a part of my life. This has been my life and so it's going to be very, very odd, I think, for all of us um, because I don't know what my day-to-day -day life consists of without you, all of you, and it's wonderful and I just want to say that um, I've loved every minute and thank you all very, very much because you made last year's <laughs> Thank you. Part two, there has been a lot of action sequences. I mean, it's a really, really fast ride, this second film. At least an hour's worth of constant fighting. And also, it's an opportunity to get some blood <laughs> splattered about, which we don't do on Harry Potter very often. I mean, there's a heck of a lot of silicon makeup running around the screen for a lot of the movie. Horrible burns. These are from uh, Neville uh, and Seamus Blood, the, uh, the bridge. Neville! So this all happens and his hands get burnt to this. <laughs> that went well. <laughs> We're doing... Um, Burns, right? Yeah, burns. We're doing burns the on, from the explosion from the bridge. <laughs> and we put this old skin plus on first and pick away at the edges. And it sort of looks like the skin's sort of burnt and peeled away. Nasty. And then we're going to put some... We're going to colour it up. Colour in and soot and blood. Just regular tea leaves. Just to sort of make it look more nasty, really. <laughs> so, well, it's to give it a bit of a 3D dimension. Yeah. Shot. I must say, my fingernails aren't normally this dirty. Amanda can confirm that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it 
there's um lots of lots of blood and gore and stuff on this. So all you your makeup is, takes about an hour. Do you enjoy regular makeup or the blood and? I love blood all the blood. I do love all the blood and gore. I have to admit, yeah, it's good fun. And it, oh, it looks nasty. I remember when when um we sort of we had it done. And Amanda, who does the makeup, she sort of just was adding stuff to the middle of it. And I sort of winced a little bit, as if, as if it was actually a real thing. My, my, my mind, sort of a phantom bird, had, had convinced itself that, that was a real bird. It's quite exciting for me, because since the very first film, so what, nine, ten years ago, all I've ever had was a, a bloody nose in number five, and that was it. And, um, and then this year we've just got everything. Well, you like it as well, don't you? Yeah, I do, yeah, it's wicked, yeah. I mean, some people don't. My mother has to get this right every day, regardless of whether I'm in the shot or whether I'm whether I'm close to the camera far away. It's got to be right every time, just in case. Thank you. Very much. Oh, thank you. I just trust. I trust you, Amanda. That's what it is. I trust you. <laughs> in this particular scene, it's just after Voldemort's fired a heavy spell at Neville, and he lands in a pile of rubble. I mean, originally it was supposed to just be like where it is now the top section of my head. And then when we put the bald, bald piece in, there was wet blood put on that, and it all leaked down over my face, down here. And, um, and David Yates, and David Hamer, and David Barry, I really liked it. So we kept it. And Amanda thought, how the heck am I gonna redo that? <laughs> all done. <laughs> Look at him. It's a hard life, isn't it? Yeah, I got He was having a huge amount of fun with it. Because, of course, there is something in all of us, well, certainly in my world, <laughs> where grossing people out is quite fun. No! So, blood and guts love it. <laughs>
I think Hermione is kind of growing into her looks and kind of growing into her body, but I think she still feels insecure about it and she's kind of quite shy and quite almost prudish in a way. So to play Bellatrix, who has these amazing voluptuous breasts and she wears a corset and she's evil and she's a witch. <laughs> I think she just feels really uncomfortable about the whole thing. Not only is the tension of being in this really threatening environment, Gringotts not wanting to be exposed, but also there's the fact that Hermione just wouldn't want to be Bellatrix. She hates her. What she was trying to get across is how uncomfortable Hermione would be in Helena's body because they are so different as people. You know, that's good. That's very Hermione. And so you could see the awkwardness of Helena's walk in there. And I think it adds a strange tension and also some humor. It was funny, it's sweet. It, it was, I really liked working with her. It was quite amazing, really. She really got the kind of walk and what Emma kind of speaks and stuff. I hardly think that'll be necessary. It's a role that has certain challenges, but Helena made a very good Emma. And it was quite charming, actually. I don't like to be kept waiting. Very well, Madame Lestrange. You have to call me Emma. I'm oh, sorry, Emma. <laughs> Harry and Voldemort have been at each other now since the fourth film. <laughs> Something's got to give. When everyone's life is on the line, these characters turn to these incredible kind of heroes. Give me Harry Potter. And do this, and none shall be harmed. Voldemort will destroy all Harry's friends if they try to protect him. Devil! Harry's going to have to be the one that deals with Voldemort. What great bravery is there? than to say, I will give my life for my friends. You can't give yourself up to him. And Voldemort has finally won. He's got Harry dead in Hagrid's arms. He's proved to the world that he can beat this child, this child who has perplexed him throughout these stories. When Hagrid comes out carrying Harry, it's the most depressing sight ever because it just looks like everything they fought for is gone and everyone else on the good side, say, they're just sort of struck dumb. They're all just standing there and Ginny runs out and she cries. No! no! Silence! Stupid girl! That was definitely Nick sort of a daunting moment to portray the complete loss that Ginny feels. Obviously already losing a brother in the battle and then now the main person that keeps her going is then gone. Harry Potter is dead. From this day forth, you put your faith in me. Voldemort has this speech of victory and relishes the defeat and makes a sort of propagandist case of how Harry's cowardice and weakness. And I think a sort of kind of crazy thing is unleashed. And while you battled and fought courageously until you could no longer will yourself to stand, he had long since fallen on his knees. Ray comes right up in front of me and he's telling us all to step forward and join his forces. And typical, myself and Dean Thomas, uh, we're standing up to him. Don't ask us why. Are we standing on the ground then when he's coming over towards us? Or? Well, I think um, we'll do whatever feels right in your tummy, honestly. Um, but, you know, when Ray kind of fixes you with those eyes, he's kind of it's quite scary. Scary. Yeah. 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 David came up to a few of us and had a talk about what we thought our characters would do. We decided that Dean and Seamus certainly would, as difficult as it would be, do their best to stand their ground. And I think that's right, I think they would. I mean, with Rafe in full flow coming towards you looking demonic and very terrifying, it wasn't an easy thing to do. Um, I instinctively took a sort of step back. <laughs> Again, eventually I found the courage for it. And we've shot most of that in this sort of apocalyptic, destroyed 
Hogwarts. It looks like a set of, a, you know, a World War II movie. It's fantastic. The way they constructed the partially destroyed Hogwarts is absolutely staggering. You, you just think it's absolutely real until you touch it, and then you realize it's too warm to be solid stone. We needed somewhere for the great defense of Hogwarts to be played out. And so the courtyard has multiplied inside. It was always the idea of you'd read about them in the, in the book and you didn't know how they were going to do them when, when you actually got there. And, uh, and it helps the whole environment, you know, when you're working on the film, when you're trying to get into the character and stuff. It just helps, you know. It represents so much what we've been doing for the last seven or eight years, so emotions are coming easy, which is great for the scene. <laughs> Draco! Draco is the first one of the good guys to sort of come over, so lots of evil glares from everyone around me. But um, obviously, I'm, I don't really have a choice. My dad's sort of clicking his fingers, saying, here, here. Draco. When it comes to the crunch, Lucius wants his son to stay alive, and he is distraught at the thought that Draco might rather die than join the Death Eaters. He's in turmoil, really. He doesn't quite know where the, you know, the good side is the, uh, is the right side to be on. But uh, unfortunately, his father and his mother take, take Paul Rank with him and pull him over back to the, uh, the evil side. So much to his uh, unfavorable distaste, I'm sure, he gets dragged back into Voldemort's side. On the end, Draco and, and Narcissa, they don't really see themselves as being much, much use, so they go and let the battle commence, really. So, yeah, flee to safety. <laughs> And that goes to the heart, really, of the series, is the question, why fight? Why fight? We accept the inevitability of evil in the world, and we accept that things can't always be fair. We accept that things will never be perfect. Why fight? Why fight? And that's a question that all of the characters answer in their different ways. And some characters say, I'm not fighting. I have to accept the inevitable. And other characters say, I will fight till I die. In this moment, where the good guys are essentially defeated, Harry is dead, their leader, gone. The only means by which to defeat Voldemort, gone. And Neville stands up and confronts Voldemort. I'd like to say something. Neville was put into Gryffindor for a reason. You know, people who are in Gryffindor are the courageous ones, are the, the, the lion hearts. But still, you, you didn't understand. He never seemed someone who deserved to be in this, this proud, heroic house of Gryffindor. This is not over! But then, after all he's gone through in the last year, he's still willing to throw himself into the breach and say, look, this is not over. We're going to fight until there's no breath left in our lungs. And, um, and at that moment, everyone realised he's willing to give his life up for the right thing. That is courage. It was just so different. There was fire blazing, there was uh, rubble everywhere, there was the bodies of students laid just across the courtyard. Um, and there was um, hundreds of Death Eaters coming marching up. Here we go, and action. It's an astonishing thing to be there doing those seeds. They're difficult things to coordinate with so many people there, hundreds of people in the courtyard. All right, the number one's all around, here we go. An enormous set, you know, so much going on. But it's fantastic to be in the middle of it because you're suddenly plunged into that world completely. Go, go, go! Right, crew wise, can we all back off for a minute, please? I mean, we've always had a massive crew, and it's always been a big film in terms of what we we're attempting to achieve, but uh, nothing compared to this, this year. You're just going to be on either side, one's on the ready, guys, okay? The battle's just finished and you're just sort of staggering around. There's literally hundreds of school children and hundreds of Death Eaters. And then on top of that, the main cast, who are 47 on a call sheet, people have been working for months for this. And then David Yates says, OK, we're going to play this for real. And nobody stops until I say cut. All right, let's stand by to shoot, please. And then somebody suddenly says, and sound rolling. Sound speed. Camera rolling. And everybody waits for it. Ready and action. And that is years of work for those few moments. And it's a privilege to be on those sets. It's a privilege because you're working with the best of the best. The skills we've been able to attract on these films are tremendous. The whole gamut of skills is really very high indeed. I remember when I first walked onto the courtyard set to see it all 
trashed, all broken down, and the rubble everywhere. I mean, the scale of it, it's something so grand and so spectacular and absolutely befitting to the finale of the story. There were a few stages along the way, but um, I did know that when, when you saw Hogwarts like that, I knew we ultimately we weren't coming back. That scene will be a bit of a... It, it will be both, oh, my God, isn't this awful, but at the same time, wow, look at all these people I recognise from the last ten years. We have probably the best British cast that will ever be assembled together in one place, ever, ever. I mean, I don't think there will be anything like this ever again that will bring together so many kind of, like, top, 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 <laughs> the best there is British actors. You just think, well, I mean, this is going to be a fantastic day on set, and it is. I mean, makeup took for hours, no one cares. Everyone just sits down and catches up having breakfast. It also shows, um, I think, how much, no matter how small your involvement in these films has been, if you've been there since the beginning, you want to make sure that they turn out right. It's very fun, like, having us all back together now, regrouping the whole family. It's like, it's like your aunties and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters all coming back together again for a reunion and it's been amazing. I've really enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> yeah, look at him. It's a hard life, isn't it? Yeah, I got my poncho thing. on. Hey, I was just... Uh... This is it, you go Hollywood overnight and what's a poncho, what's a, yeah. a hot water bottle under there? Yeah. You're right. I usually do actually, right, I've got, got one today, someone needs to sort that out. I like your hair today. So. Cheers mate, it's looking uh, genuine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>